It is my pleasure to introduce the panel to you. We have Gerardo Esquivel from Colmex, Jana Rems from the McKinsey Global Institute, and Harley Shaken from UC Berkeley. And here with us today to moderate this panel, we have Dudley Althaus from the Wall Street Journal. Thank you all. All right, uh, we're gonna hope to work up an appetite for y'all and have a kind of a lively conversation. Uh, Jana, if you wanna go ahead, please. Absolutely, thank you so much, Gordon. Melissa, for having, uh, having me invited me to join you today. Um, lovely to be back. We at the McKinsey Global Institute tend to focus on questions of, of what is happening underneath at the industries and sectors that explain some of the big macroeconomic phenomena. And there probably are a few questions as challenging, I think, for economists is why has Mexico not grown faster despite everything they have done, despite NAFTA? A question that Gordon, amongst others, have, have looked at. And in our last effort, when we looked at this specifically, it was pretty clear that the answer came from, not from the fact that NAFTA hasn't had an impact, but it has had an impact very unevenly across the US economy. So I'll be very, very brief, so we'll have time to discuss further so you can ask, ask more. But um, as a starter, just to set the stage, just like we heard before, Mexico has been growing exceptionally slowly, even after the NAFTA period in 1990, only 2.7% a year, which is very low growth for a country so young. Every year, US GDP has expanded by a full two percentage points since then as a result of it has simply having a bigger workforce. That is a real difference, even within its Latin American peers, but particularly with some of the Asian um, tigers, India and China most notably, where productivity has been fueling much of the growth. So in many ways, Mexico's problem is a productivity problem. And when you look at the path on Mexico's productivity, it actually did very well during the Mexican miracle time in the second half of the, uh, to, of the last century. That came to an abrupt rent in 1980 during the lost decade. But even after NAFTA, from 1990 onward, Mexico's productivity growth have been less than a percentage point a year, which is staggeringly low, particularly for a country that starts from a low level and that has the young um, employment force, that has new NAFTA, new trade opportunities, big changes happening in the economy. So what is happening with Mexico's productivity? And the answer is pretty clearly when you look underneath is that we are talking about two dramatically different economies. So when you look at all of Mexico's companies across the board, about one-fifth of the workforce works in large corporations, large establishments of 500 or more inhabitants. There, the productivity already in um, the turn of the century was about four times the productivity of the smaller businesses. There, MRAFTA has worked very well. Productivity has grown in these large establishments by over 6% a year, which is pretty respectable, even by Asian tiger standards. On the other hand, 40% of Mexico's labor force works in small businesses with less than 10 workers, and their productivity actually has declined. What this means is that you have many family businesses where you might have more workers coming to the business, yet the output is not growing the same way. You can actually see productivity decline pretty dramatically. And as a result, we are seeing these two extremes of the, uh, of the Mexican economy diverge. Right now, in, in 2009, we saw the productivity of the lower end businesses, or so smaller businesses, mostly informal, um, be only about a 10% of the larger businesses' productivity, which is down from the quarter it was 10 years before. This, that gap has closed a little bit since then when you look at the latest, latest um, survey, simply because of the fact that the bigger businesses have had a harder time in the last five years, but still, it's about seven times more productive on the top end. And what is pretty, um, surprising perhaps is that the middle has been narrowing down. The Mexican middle-sized companies have been suffering since the turn of the century. Their employment hasn't increased, their productivity has been flat, recently even declining, as they have lost a lot of the, particularly the businesses that have between 50 and 1,000 employees, they have lost to competition for lower cost Asian imports at the same time, as well as lost to the smaller businesses that are informal, often avoid many of the, many of the costs that you get from becoming informal. So if this is really the story of the Mexico's productivity challenge, the fact that we are seeing, on one hand, the runaway success of many of the larger corporations, 
but whose employment share is not growing. Only one out of five employers work in those formal businesses, while the larger, ma larger majority is working on businesses where productivity is not growing. And I will leave those facts there as a, as a starter, but that's the big challenge as we think of NAFTA forward, NAFTA going forward, how can we make sure that we get the productivity gains to the broad base of four out of five Mexican workers, and how do we get the income gains to that segment that go with higher productivity? Thank you. What I'll be talking about is um, something related to what uh, just Joanna mentioned. Uh, first of all, let me say something, uh, just to make it clear. I, I strongly support NAFTA, and I think NAFTA has brought many, many benefits to the whole region. Uh, particularly, there is one area of benefits which I think has always been underestimated when we discuss NAFTA, and this is in the sense of, of how much have we benefited as a consumers not just in terms of the variety of goods that we can consume now, but, but in terms of a price effect also. So, uh, so this is very important always to keep in mind when we evaluate, it, evaluate NAFTA. Uh, however, since the, 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 the table is, is, is entitled uh, about the imperfections of NAFTA, I have to mention something about that. Can I have the, this one, please? Sorry. Uh, and I think, I think when we think about the imperfection of NAFTA, uh, the most important one is, is it has failed to deliver some of the things it promised particularly to Mexico. And I think this is, this is uh, somehow what, what Joanna was, was, was mentioning. And I think the most important one has to do with, with two dimensions. One is growth, and the other one is um, uh, wages, of course, uh, and convergence in general. But what's promised with NAFTA, if you remember the discussion back then in the 1990s, was that NAFTA was supposed to promote convergence. Uh, not just, it, was just, it was not just a trade and investment agreement. It was much more than that. It had a NAFTA vision uh, within. Uh, and part of that, the argument was, and the way in which what NAFTA was uh, uh, sold in Mexico, was that NAFTA was going to bring development in, into Mexico, and that we were going to sort of converge slowly, but eventually to converge to, to, the, to, to the levels of well-being that we had in North America. The relationship of GDP per capita between Mexico and the US uh, and that has mostly remained stable for the past two decades. And if you look at the GDP per person, and this is strictly related to the productivity issue that Joanna just mentioned, that has even declined, has declined from 45% that used to be in 1990 to close to 35% according to, to last year figures. So, so Mexico has not converged in that dimensions, neither in terms of productivity per person or productivity or income per capita. So, um, uh, so there are some areas in which NAFTA has failed to deliver it to Mexico, at least in these dimensions. Of course, that has brought many benefits in many uh, regions, in many sectors, to many people in Mexico. But there are also some areas, some sectors in which that hasn't happened yet. And that is related uh, not just to the way in, in which NAFTA has been implemented in Mexico, or, or I, rather I could say by the lack of uh, some policies in some areas, like, um, for example, we haven't invested enough in productivity, we haven't invested enough in, in education, and so on and so forth. And that has uh, led us to not to be able to re-up the whole benefits of an ag agreement like the NAFTA, like the one we have with the, North, with, with the rest of North America. So, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's probably the main uh, uh, the fail of NAFTA, the main imperfection of NAFTA for Mexico. Now, what can we do? Um, uh, we can do many things, and one of, uh, one of the areas, by the way, is, is, is actually in that figure, which is um, uh, the share of income going to labor. That has declined, and not just uh, in, in Mexico at the time, uh, overall, but also even in those areas which are, like, as you can see here, which is called the global manufacturing sectors. Uh, so even in those sectors in which we have benefited from NAFTA, uh, there has been some trend in Mexico, and this is something that I put in the presentation just because Dudley asked us to, to address this issue in terms of uh, uh, labor wages in some, air, in some sectors. And it's in specific, let me show you what, has, what happens in the automotive industry uh, in both dimensions, in the production of cars and the production of uh, auto parts. Uh, as you can see there, the distribution of value added is completely biased towards uh, returns to capital. So that means that, re that benefit react from this expansion in these sectors is fully concentrated in some sector, in, 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 in particularly in capital, particularly in the area of uh, production of cars. 
What does that mean? There are some political economy issues in Mexico, and there are some e economic factors in Mexico that have impeded Mexico and Mexicans to benefit from, from an agreement like NAFTA. This is not the fault of NAFTA, I would say. And this is very important to keep in mind. It is, it is because we in Mexico, we haven't done some other things just to fully exploit the benefits of an agreement like the one we have. And this is always very important. But as important it is to understand the benefits of NAFTA, it is important to, to understand the limits of NAFTA. And that's why in Mexico, as in the US, we have people that oppose NAFTA. And I think the, the main problem that we are now facing in the future is that because of outcomes like this, there are people who is against free trade. And instead of thinking about how a, 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 a weakening NAFTA or, 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 or a, imposing limits to NAFTA, I think we need to look for to, in ways in which we can strengthen the links between the three countries. Not only that, we, we should look for measures in order to be able to redistribute be better the benefits of globalization or the benefits of trade, which is something which, in the end, it, it is in, in, it, w that's why we have in, in the middle of these discussions, because the, the benefits of globalization are not evenly distributed. Uh, so there are some sectors, some regions, some people that doesn't benefit from this. And this is important, as I said. A, a few days ago, there was a, a, a group of people from the agricultural sector in Mexico that walked into the, uh, approach the US embassy in Mexico with a letter saying, thanks, President Donald Trump, for stopping NAFTA. So uh, just imagine, uh, in, uh, of course, what we have been discussing here and all the information that has been provided in the previous presentations goes in the way of saying, how important is NAFTA? And it is very important. And I think that by getting rid of NAFTA, the, on, the only thing we're going to do is to, we're going to weaken the whole region as a whole, as a, in terms of competitiveness with the rest of the world. But there are some, pe some people, some sectors again, and, so, and some regions which have not benefited that much. And I think we should understand that. It's just to think about how to make globalization better. One of the th dimensions in which NAFTA can be improved, by the way, is by discussing a good uh, and orderly um, labor agreement. And this is something uh, some of us we have proposed. There is a, a blueprint prepared by President Cedillo and, and former Ministry of Commerce, Carlos Gutierrez, together with a, with a team of, of academics and public intellectuals so on, where I, in which I participated, that proposed precisely that a few months ago. So that's the way in which we should look to strengthen our links between, within the region, not trying to get rid of NAFTA because we will have all these effects that have been discussed before. And I think that would only lead to a weakening of the whole region and, and, and a, a being less able to compete with other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I'm very pleased to be here, but I'm a little daunted by the fact that I am the last speaker between you and lunch. So this puts a premium on clarity and brevity. I think we've had a broad agreement today that I certainly share in that trade of a strong, vibrant, growing trading relationship between the three countries of North America can be in everyone's interest. I would argue, however, that NAFTA has not delivered on that promise. That in fact, there are important flaws in the agreement that urgently need to be addressed and in fact can be addressed but an important part of that is recognizing that it isn't simply a large benefit to all three countries without examining not which country wins or loses, as President Trump seems to do, but rather who in each country wins, who in each country loses, and can we have rules of the game that result in more winners and less losers? Currently, this is obviously complicated by President Trump, uh, the use of ugly re rhetoric, an obsession with walls, and actual actions on immigration have complicated the relationship uh, in very negative ways between the United States and Mexico. But to be critical of NAFTA is not to be accepting of any of this. 
I'd like to focus on a single dimension of NAFTA that I think is problematic, but it is also a dimension that offers great promise for Mexico and for the United States and Canada as well. It's what I would call the Mexican paradox. During the last 22 years under NAFTA, in fact, for decades before, but exacerbated under NAFTA, Mexican workers have produced more in the export sector and earned less. That is not a route to the middle class. That is a route to becoming an export platform, which NAFTA has, in fact, made Mex or laid the basis for in terms of Mexico. What does this look like specifically? Under NAFTA from 1994 to 2011, productivity in Mexican manufacturing rose by 80 percent. Real compensation, wages and benefits adjusted for inflation, declined by 20 percent. And that was on a base of a real gap prior to this. So a critical question in terms of renegotiating NAFTA is how do you address that? Is that simply a fact of nature, or does that represent an institutional failure, in fact, that can be addressed? In this case, I would argue a critical failure here is the lack of labor rights in the export sector. If workers can't choose freely to form an independent union and bargain collectively, then this gap between rising productivity and declining compensation continues. The flip side of that is you have declining purchasing power for many of these workers. Let me put this in very a very specific context. Uh, the average wage in Mexican manufacturing in 2015 was $2.40 an hour. By Mexican standards, if you multiply that times 2,000 hours, the average worker in Mexican manufacturing working full time is $3,000 below the poverty level for a family of four in Mexico. That's not a healthy recipe for a growing economy but it puts a double burden on U.S. workers. There is, in fact, a measurable and significant job loss related to NAFTA, but there's also a much broader downward pressure on wages in manufacturing, to be sure, but beyond manufacturing as well. As Joe Stiglitz points out, and this is hardly only NAFTA, but NAFTA contributes this, uh, the average U.S. worker without a college e education earns roughly what that worker earned, actually earns less than that worker earned median wage 42 years ago. For the bottom of the income distribution in the U.S., 60 percent, or it is less now than it was 60 years ago, according to Joe Stiglitz. Those are not good numbers. We have seen the political reaction to this in the context of the recent election in the U.S. That's deeply troubling. Our goal going forward, I think, ought to be to a NAFTA that's renegotiated that addresses this gap between rising productivity and real wages. That will lead to a more competitive Mexican, U.S., and Canadian economy. It's not throwing up walls, but it's rather seeking to harmonize labor standards to the higher rather than to the lowest level. Uh, the Trump administration has put forward protectionist nationalism as the solution to this problem. It resonated with a lot of voters. In my view, that's the wrong direction. I think we can have a progressive internationalism that seeks to expand trade, but on a basis where worker rights are respected across all three countries. Purchasing power grows as a result, and we, re we have combined a more democratic societies and less inequality. Wow.
Let me start with a question for Gerardo. Uh, you talked about the barriers to for wages to rise, uh, internal Mexican obstacles for, for rising wages. The Wall Street Journal, I was part of the story last summer, we published a story about the labor shortage in cities like Juarez on the border and in the Bajio. Uh, despite the labor shortage, um, wages haven't risen at all. And that, it was a long time since I took Economics 101, but that makes no sense in capitalist economics, supply and demand. In the Bajio, I found workers working at Japanese uh, auto component plants making 800 pesos a week for a 60 hour week, five 12 hour shifts. And I was told by a Mexican uh, human uh, re uh, resources executive that in fact executives sometimes collude in not hiring each other's workers so as to keep the wages down. So if we could talk a little bit about what you see as the obstacles to, to wages increase. I, I think the answer is precisely what Harley just mentioned, is the fact that the way in which labor rights are implemented in Mexico are against workers. We, have, we need a labor reform in that direction. I mean, uh, the discussion on labor reform in Mexico that uh, just took place um, a few years ago, the main idea was to, to, to flexibilize the labor market which was needed in some sense, but it didn't address the most important issue, which is the way in which uh, workers are represented. I mean, um, I don't know if you know how to do, does this work, but the, the way it works is that uh, in Mexico, uh, if there is only one union that is recognized by, authority, by the authority, and what the firms do, particularly those firms that go and invest in Mexico, they go already with a, with a union, which is before, even before having workers, they already have a, a union leader, so that that's the representative of workers, but it's actually a person working for the firm. In that sense, there is no way in which we can have this, this uh, representation of workers, and they cannot actually demand that. And, and that's why, surprisingly, Mexico, in the past two years, hasn't had any single strike, just to give you an idea. And this is not because we are very peaceful or people is, is very happy with the, with, with the wages they earn. It is because the law is, act, is actually working against uh, the rights of workers. The famous protection contracts. Exactly. But on the other hand, then, you have a lot of rogue union guys who are basically blackmail companies as well. They can shut down a company forever. So there's, a, there's an endemic problem. That's the other dimension. Well. But, but that's actually, it's actually working against small and medium-sized firms. And that's another part of the problem. But in the end, the whole thing is actually, is, 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 we can synthesize that, that problem with the labor laws that we currently have in Mexico. But just keep in mind one thing. For example, one of the, of the issues in TPP was, was, was the issue of minimum wage. Minimum wage in Mexico currently is just 500 pesos per week. That means $25 per week, just to give you an idea how low it is. So th that's a policy. That's a public policy that in the past two decades, or two and a half decades more or less, ha has led to a decline in the minimum wage in real terms close to 70%. So that puts a, a lot of pressure in, 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 the, in the labor market. So it is true, as Joanna said, that uh, wages in, in these sectors cannot increase that fast, because, even if you change the laws, because you have all this pool of workers willing to work. Um, uh, which are not even in that sector. Not all of them have the skills, of course, to be able to work in those, in those sectors. But still, th that puts a, a, a market pressure in, in, in for wages. But if in addition to that, we have the fact that we have all these laws that go against increasing wages and are actually diminishing the, the, real, the, the real income of workers as, as much as, as I said, 75% in the past two decades or so. So that's critically affecting the, the, the level of income of these workers, critically affecting the, the purchasing power that they have. And that's why I think that internal market in Mexico is so weak. We have, uh, I don't know if you know this, but we have currently 50% of the population living a, a, in, in poverty condition, which is pretty much the same rate of poverty that we used to have in, back in 1992 when, 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 they, when, when this measure was, was first measured officially. Uh, so we, we had now 53% of people living in, in, in poverty. We have 53% back in 1992. So we haven't been able to reduce poverty, despite the fact that in, the, in these three, three or so decades, income per capita has grown very little, yes, but has grown some, somehow. But that has not been uh, translated into reduction of poverty because that has not affected wages as 
it was supposed to be. So, um, so it is it is a set of things. It is it is the, the minimum wage policy. It is it is the labor policy in general, uh, and it is also, as I said, the lack of investment, enough investment in some areas like education and infrastructure. So that has impeded Mexico to grow and to he, be able to translate that into benefits for the, for for the workers in general. Isn't part of that the. Uh, the argument against uh, that, that half the population is still in poverty, people never mention the tremendous population growth of the past 30 years in Mexico as well. Um, I remember very clearly in 1984, Mexico had 69 million people. Today it's about 120 million people. Uh, and your study, Yana, as from several years ago, saw that all the GDP growth in Mexico, almost all of it, was from population growth, not really any productivity growth or anything else. This is pretty amazing. I mean, I don't know if you can comment on it or, or Gerardo. Or it, it, the population now is slowing down. The population growth is slowing down. So does that put Mexico in even a worse trap uh, as far as productivity and, and GDP growth? Absolutely. I think it's actually striking, even globally in the last 50 years, um, half of global GDP growth has come from the fact that we have more people. It was an unusual time. But I think in Latin America and Mexico in particular, in early 1970s, an average Mexican woman had almost seven children. Today, that number is just about two. And that means that 15 years later, you see very large cohorts of folks coming to the workforce. And when that decline happens, you actually see much, much smaller cohorts of, of young people coming into the pool. So if in the last 15 years, we have on average gotten, actually for the last 25 years, we have on average gotten two years, two percentage points every year of GDP growth from um, larger pool of workers, we will only get in Mexico 1.2% to 2025 in the next 10 years. So it's a pretty dramatic decline, almost, I mean, it's from 2% to one2 a year. And that means that unless productivity improves, Mexico's GDP growth is going to be roughly 2%. So now you add the 0.8% that you saw earlier as the, as the average um, productivity growth in that, in that period. And I think that really is a pretty dramatic shift. Good. I, I think uh, it's lunchtime. We're going to cut it right here. Thank you all very much.